أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد This is our sixth session uh, on our tafsir of Surah Nuh and our last session as well Last week we stopped at verse 23 of Surah Nuh and uh, tonight we continue with verse 24 to the end of the surah insha'Allah in the last verse that we saw um, the last time um, we found that the elders of the community of the Prophet Nuh were encouraging people not to follow Nuh salam, and they were saying to them they say do not abandon your gods do not abandon Wad nor Suwa nor Yaghuth, Ya'uq, and Nasr. In continuing with that, Nuh is still lamenting to his Lord, and uh, he now says, verse 24, وَقَدْ أَضَلُّوا كَثِيرًا And already they have led many astray. وَلَا تَزِدِ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا ضلالا. And do not increase the wrongdoers in anything except error. The first part of this verse is, and already they have led many astray. And uh, here the um, exegists or the mufassirun of the Qur'an um, have discussed who is it that Nuh is referring to when he says they have led many astray. Some have said that, and they have led many astray refers to the idols themselves, meaning the Wad and Suwa and Yaghuth and Ya'uq and Nasr. And as proof of this, they quote um, chapter 14 of the Qur'an, verse 35 and 36, in which the Prophet Abraham or Ibrahim salam, says, My Lord, and save me and my children from worshipping idols. My Lord, indeed, they have misled many people. So in chapter 14, Ibrahim refers to the idols as having misled many people. And therefore, some commentators of the Qur'an say that here as well, um, they have led astray refer to uh, um, these idols. The other opinion, of course, is that, and they have led astray, meaning the, the elders of the community, the elite, uh, those with affluence, um, are the ones who have led many astray. Um, and of course, there are arguments to both sides. Those who say it refers to the idols, they believe that this verse connects to the end of the previous verse where the idols are mentioned and those who say it refers to the elite um, or the elders of the community they argue that this verse connects to the start of the previous verse which said they say meaning those who say are the same ones who have led many astray um, we could actually say that um, quite likely in this surah it is the elders of the community that are being referred to and not the idols. This is for various reasons. Firstly, because if you look at verse 22 that we discussed the last time, Nuh is holding the elders of the community responsible for plotting against him. Uh, in verse 22, he said, وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرًا kubara," And they have devised an outrageous plot. So it seems to suggest a continuation that the very same people who have devised an outrageous plot are the ones who have now led many um, astray. The other reason to believe this verse is referring to the elders and not to the idols and it is the elders and the leaders of the community who are leading others astray is because this very same verse when it continues Noah says and do not increase the unjust or the wrongdoers the dhalimeen in anything except error. So the wrongdoers or the unjust are obviously the people and not um, the idols. And lastly but not least, even in the previous verse, um, the subject were the elders of the community. They are the ones that Nuh says, they say, do not abandon your gods. Um, the idols themselves are more a predicate to that uh, verse. They are not the primary subject. And therefore, it would make sense that if you read the verses from um, 
21 onwards, the same people who, who are followed because of their wealth and children, they are the ones who plot and devise the outrageous plot, they are the ones who say, do not abandon your gods, and they are the ones who now have led many astray and whom Nuh curses, saying, وَلَا تَزِدِ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا ضَلَالًا Meaning, my Lord, do not increase these unjust or these wrongdoers in anything except error. Now, it may seem strange that a prophet like Noah or Nuh is uh, uh, cursing people, not only cursing, but asking God to actually misguide them, to increase them in their dalal or their error or misguidance. And uh, some commentators have tried to justify this in various ways. For example, one Mufassir says that maybe what Nuh meant was um, he's asking God not to misguide them in terms of their religion and salvation, but misguide them in their worldly affairs, um, which empowers them to rebel and to plot against him. But such justifications are really not necessary because First of all, Nuh is explicitly asking um, Allah to increase in error the wrongdoers, the unjust. He is not asking Allah to misguide innocent people. He is saying the zalimin, the, the, the wrongdoers, increase them in the lal. Secondly, Nuh is not even asking Allah to misguide the wrongdoers. He says increase them. وَلَا تَزِدِ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا Dalala, uh, and this is because if you put this in context, you realize that this Dalimin are already misguided; they are already in error. And Nuh is simply asking that that uh, uh, be increased as a form of punishment. For example, in chapter 54, verse 47 of the Quran, we are told the guilty are already in error. Um, and in chapter 16, verse 37, we are told, Indeed, Allah does not guide those who mislead others. And in that same chapter, chapter 16, verse 107, we are told Allah does not guide the faithless lot. Um, and therefore, Nuh is simply asking that they are increased in error. It can be seen in light of other verses as well, like for example in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 10, we are told there is a sickness in their hearts. Fi qulubihim marad. That means there is already a problem to begin with. marada. So Allah increased their sickness. Or for example, in chapter 61, verse 5, we are told, so when they swerved, then Allah made their hearts swerve, and Allah does not guide the transgressing lot. Um, in other words, human beings will first choose misguidance, and they will choose transgression before Allah misguides them. And again, we ask this question, even when they choose misguidance, and then Allah increases them in misguidance, how does Allah misguide a person? And this is a lengthy subject in itself. Allah does not misguide a person in the sense that we think where he purposely leads him down the wrong path so that he goes astray and destroys his uh, chances of salvation in the hereafter. What it means when it says God misguides or Allah misguides is simply he leaves them to their own devices. Or to put this differently, a human being constantly needs to hold on to um, his or her creator, a human being constantly needs to hold on to Allah in order to be guided. It is for this reason that five times a day in our prayers as Muslims, when we recite the Surah Al-Fatiha, we say, Ihdina Sarat Al-Mustaqeem. Whether we translate this as guide us to the right path or keep us on the right path, the fact remains that if it was up to us to stay on the right path, we would not have a need to constantly five times a day or, or even ten times a day when you count the number of uh, units of prayers within the five prayers, um, we're constantly asking Allah, keep us, guide us on the right path. This itself suggests that on our own, we are inclined or prone to, to walking off the right path, and we constantly need our 
hands, so to speak, to be held so that we walk on that right path. When one chooses misguidance, one refuses to be held by Allah. And so in being left to one's own devices, that is how Allah misguides a person. And that is why you will find any verse of Quran that talks of Allah misguiding a person, there is always a qualifier to say he only misguides the transgressors or they have a sickness in their hearts or they swerve and then Allah causes them to swerve, meaning he leaves them to their own uh, um, selves. And so in the language of the, the, the scholars, this misguidance or dalal that, uh, uh, that Nuh is praying for is not uh, a fresh misguidance, meaning it is not an ad-dalal ibtida'i. It is more a retributive misguidance, a form of punishment, what might be called ad-dalal uh, mujaza. And this is because of their existing faithlessness and mischief. And it is interesting as well that Nuh refers to them as zalimin, wrongdoers or unjust. And this is interesting because these were idol worshippers, they were polytheists. In other words, they committed the sin of shirk or polytheism. And in chapter um, 31, verse 13 of the Quran, Allah defines shirk as a great injustice or a great wrongdoing. He, he refers to this as in the shirk la dhulmun azim. So shirk is dhulmun azim, and that is perhaps why Nuh refers to them as uh, zalimin. Um, we shall see that in the last verse of this surah as well, the Prophet Nuh ala uh, nabiyyina wa alayhi salam is also cursing the people again. Um, so we could also um, safely assume that this cursing on behalf on, 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 from, from, from Nuh alayhi salam was perhaps after he was assured by um, Allah after he had preached for 950 years, he was assured by Allah that these people will not uh, listen to you anymore. Those who are left now who have refused guidance, um, there is no point in, in, in preaching to them anymore. And that is when he is asked to build the ark. We are told very clearly in chapter 11, verse 36, that uh, um, Allah says or assures uh, Nuh salam, none of your people will believe except those who have already uh, who already have faith. Um, and therefore this is perhaps the, the background to why he, he curses them. Um, we may also derive from this verse that in a sense it is a desire of the faithful to see that faithlessness is removed from the earth, that it is extinguished from the earth. Um, and clearly those who will not repent um, deserve to be increased in their punishment because when they are left uh, unpunished they continue in their plotting to misguide others. So just as a quick reference uh, to see how this applies in the case of other prophets and messengers as well and other individuals who are righteous, we see in chapter 5 Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 28 and 29 the two sons of Adam alayhi salam um, when the one who was evil wanted to kill his brother who was righteous, the righteous brother says, even if you extend your hand toward me to kill me, I will not extend my hand toward you to kill you. And then further on he says, I desire that you earn the burden of my sin, meaning of murdering me and your sin, to become one of the inmates of the fire. And such is the requital of the wrongdoers of the Zalimeen. Okay. And uh, very similarly, we see that uh, uh, in the case of the Prophet Moses, Musa salam as well, when the Pharaoh and his uh, um, elite, when they went too far in torturing and tormenting the, the children of Israel, and their injustices reached an extreme, and there was absolutely no hope of guiding them, um, we are told, uh, Moses said, O oh Lord, you have given Pharaoh and his elite glamour and wealth in the life of this world. Our Lord, that they may lead people astray from your way. Our Lord, blot out their wealth and harden their hearts 
so that they do not believe until they cite the punishment or the painful punishment. And then God responds and says, your supplication has been granted, so be steadfast and do not follow the way of those who do not know. And this is given in chapter 10, verse 88 and verse 89. Very clearly Moses is asking God to harden the hearts of the Pharaoh and his elite so that they will not believe until they are punished. Okay. Um, to put this differently, um, a sign of being punished in this world for one's persistent wrongdoing and one's insistence on not repenting is that God denies one the chance to uh, um, repent. And this is something we seek refuge uh, uh, in Allah from, um, that we should be of such a state that it does not even occur to us to ask for forgiveness. And this is something that the ulama um, of spirituality and ethics and morality have also discussed and we mentioned a little bit uh, regarding istidraj in previous sessions as well. Um, but this is a sign um, of punishment as well, that one becomes averse to anything that has to do with God or faith. Um, and it in a sense ties to the verse 7 in this surah where we saw um, the people when, uh, when Nuh was preaching to them and they would cover themselves with their cloaks and they would put fingers in their ears. Uh, we saw that they were persistent in their unfaith and then we are told وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا istikbara and disdainful in their arrogance. And so this is what happens when one consist, cons, uh, persistently refuses guidance. The heart becomes hard, there is arrogance, um, there is absolute refusal for any form of guidance. In a sense the heart is sealed and then it does not even occur to this person uh, and, uh, to, to repent and there is absolutely no desire um, for uh, guidance. Um, we move on to verse 25 and uh, now there is a pause in, in Noah's prayer or his curse which shall continue in the next verse. Um, there is a verse now in between and this verse is simply confirming that his prayer was answered um, and we are told now they were drowned because of their iniquities or their uh, uh, sins and then made to enter a fire. And they did not find for themselves any helpers besides Allah. Now the first part of this verse um, is very um, interesting because uh, um, there is a mention of drowning and fire together. But before we, we, we talk about that, um, there is also a clear mention that they were drowned because of their khati'at or their iniquities or their sins and their mistakes. Um, this tells us two things. One is it tells us that Allah is just. He does not punish without reason. If they were drowned, it was because of these um, um, iniquities. And secondly, it also reveals his power, that those who deserve to be punished and those who stand against God, even though they may be granted a short respite, they will not escape. In the end, they will be punished. Now, coming to this discussion on drowning and made to enter fire, um, most of the Mufassirun um, have noted the fact that uh, the word enter the fire comes immediately after the drowning. It says, Ughriku fa udkhilu nara. They were drowned and then made to enter the fire. And the conjunction particle between them um, is the Arabic letter fa. Now, in Arabic, when you want to join two events, you could use the particle wa or you could use the particle fa. What wa does is it suggests end but it does not necessarily uh, restrict the sequence or the immediacy, the immediacy of the two events. Whereas the particle fa normally suggests that the two are in sequence and there is an immediate happening of one after the other. In other words, if the verse would have said ughriku wa udkhilu nara, 
then one might have supposed that they drowned and then later on they entered the fire or perhaps they will enter the fire on the day of judgment. But the word fa suggests that as soon as they drowned, immediately they entered the fire. And uh, this immediacy is so apparent for those who appreciate the um, Arabic language and the style in which this verse is presented that uh, uh, one Mufassir, uh, Abu al-Futuh al-Razi, not Fakhruddin al-Razi, Abu al-Futuh al-Razi in his tafsir, he even goes as far as suggesting that even as they were drowning, they were burning in the fire. That's how immediate the verse is um, suggesting the two events. But most other Mufassirun, just to show that they entered the fire immediately after um, the drowning, they have quoted um, other verses in Arabic uh, of poetry. For example, we have a stanza from Ibn al-Ambari uh, in which he says, لا تعجبنا لأضداد إذا اجتمعت Do not be amazed at opposites when they come together. فالله يجمع بين الماء والنار For God has even, uh, uh, for God even brings together water and fire. And they quote these kind of uh, verses uh, under, this, uh, uh, under the tafsir of this verse of the Qur'an to show that there was an immediacy to this. Um, now, most Mufassirun, particularly the Shia Mufassirun, have said that this fire was not the fire of this world because obviously they drowned, so there is no question of them being burnt in this world. <coughs> and it is a fire that is immediate, and therefore it is a fire of Barzakh. Barzakh is sometimes loosely translated as purgatory. Uh, but purgatory is a Christian term that has certain um, implications in its understanding. Um, from an Islamic perspective, barzakh is not necessarily a punishment. The good as well go to barzakh, uh, but it is a pleasant experience. And uh, it is a detailed discussion, but we can simply translate barzakh as a middle world or an interworld where the souls of the dead reside uh, before the day of judgment. So all human beings on this earth, when they die, their souls go to this middle world called Barzakh. And here they are either in bliss or in punishment, but it is an experience of the soul and not a bodily experience. Before the final day of resurrection, where they are raised again physically in, in, in body and in spirit. Um, Allama Tabatabai says that this verse of the Qur'an is one of the strongest proofs um, of Barzakh, that Barzakh does in fact exist against those Muslim groups who might deny the existence of this uh, middle life. And it is also proof that the faithless are punished um, in this um, interworld or middle world. Um, he goes on to say that the manner in which this verse has been given does not allow us any other option. We cannot suggest that it means they shall enter the fire later on in the hereafter nor can we try and suggest that after they drowned, they entered the fire of the hereafter, because that is acknowledged by all Muslims that paradise and hellfire um, is only entered after the accounting on the final day. And um, Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi as well has favored this interpretation that this fire that the people of Nu entered is the fire of Barzakh. Um, he quotes a very popular and famous um, hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in which he said that the grave is either rawdatun min riyadh al-jannah a garden from the gardens of paradise or hufratun min hufr al-nar or it is a pit from the pits of hell and uh, therefore it does not oppose this understanding um, and in fact the people of Nuh are not the only ones to enter this fire of barzakh we have other evidence for this um, in the Qur'an, as for example the case of the Pharaoh and his people. Um, they drowned as well, as we know in the story of Moses and the Pharaoh. And uh, we are told uh, in chapter 40, verse 46 of the Qur'an, regarding um, the Pharaoh and his people, it says, The fire to which they are exposed morning and evening, 
And on the day when the hour sets in, Pharaoh's clan will enter the severest punishment. So it's very, very clear that there is a fire that they're exposed to morning and evening, which is the fire of Barzakh. And then the verse continues to say, and on the day when the hour sets in. So there is another punishment <coughs> after that for um, the Pharaoh and his people. Okay, now the later part of this verse, after it says they drowned and they enter the fire, it says, فَلَمْ يَجِدُوا لَهُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنصَارَ And they did not find for themselves any helpers besides Allah. This is again very significant because these were people um, who worshipped idols and looked up to their idols as gods. And in a sense it is a reminder that the gods whom they were not willing to abandon, you remember in verse 23 they were saying, do not abandon your gods, do not abandon uh, Wad, nor Su'a, nor Yaghuth, nor Ya'uq, nor Nasr. Um, these very gods whom they were not willing to abandon, these were now abandoning them because uh, quite likely as they were drowning, they must have been calling out to these gods uh, and asking them to rescue them and help them and then um, helplessly realizing that there is no reality to them as um, they drowned and so did their um, idols. It almost brings to mind other verses of Quran, um, of the Quran, such as chapter 21, verse 42 and 43, where we are told, who can guard you day and night from the punishment of the all-beneficent? Do they have gods besides us to defend them? And in chapter 11, verse 43 as well, we are told that uh, Noah had a son who was rebellious and who refused to board the ark. And as uh, the water was rising and, and uh, Noah was calling out to his son to come with him on the ark, he said, I shall take refuge on a mountain. It will protect me from the flood. To which Noah salam, replied, his son saying, there is none today who can protect you from Allah's edict except one upon whom he, Allah, has mercy. Okay, and this is chapter 11 verse 43. So, uh, very relevant, very powerful verse. And uh, we move on to um, the next verse where the conversation now um, returns to Nuh and uh, his curse. He now says to Allah, وَقَالَ نُوحٌ رَبِّي لَا تَذَرْ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ دَيَّارًا And Nuh said, My Lord, do not leave on the earth any inhabitant from among the faithless. A very, very powerful um, uh, curse. He is asking God to destroy everyone on the earth and says, Do not leave on the earth any inhabitant from among the faithless because obviously the faithful... Um, are boarding the ark with him um, and uh, in a sense it almost suggests he is fed up with the people but as we shall see that is not the case in fact the people were fed up with him after he had argued with them with all kinds of proofs and logic as we saw in the previous um, sessions uh, they were fed up and we are told in chapter 11 verse 32 they said to him O Noah you have disputed with us already, and you have disputed with us exceedingly. Now bring us what you threaten us with, should you be, threat should you be truthful. So they in fact invited the curse, and uh, Nuh is now in a sense despairing of them ever changing. Um, but uh, even when he curses them, uh, we shall see in the next verse why. He curses them. It is not because of any personal hate uh, or hatred um, for them. Um, and as we said in the tafsir of the previous verse, that quite likely even when he was cursing and saying, do not leave any of them on the earth, this was after he had been assured by, uh, by God that they were not going to believe, which was chapter 11, verse 36, uh, in which he was told none of them will now believe except those who have already uh, brought faith. But uh, just staying with this verse um, um, a little, um, we can also determine that this verse is proof for us 
that invoking God's curse or asking him to curse others is permissible, um, provided it is not personal and it is in support of faith and it is against the spread of um, faithlessness. And uh, we see that it wasn't just Nuh salam, who cursed people, but uh, there are other examples given in the Quran. In chapter 5, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 78, the Prophet David or Dawood salam, as well as the Prophet Jesus, uh, Isa salam, also curse their people. Um, and this is given in chapter 5, verse 78. There is also a discussion that when Noah says do not leave on the earth, does he mean the entire planet or does he mean um, the land that he inhabited? And uh, this is something we discussed in our um, very first session uh, when we were looking at uh, uh, verse 1 and 2 uh, where Noah was told, we are told that Noah was sent to his people to warn your people and he said, oh, my people, and we talked about what my people and his people meant, whether it was the whole world or just um, his community. Now, we come to verse 27, which is the second last verse in this surah, where Nuh now tells us or tells his Lord the reason why he said, do not leave on the earth any inhabitant from among the faithless. He says, إِنَّكَ إِن تَذَرْهُمْ يُضِلُّ عِبَادَكَ وَلَا يَلِدُ إِلَّا فَاجِرًا كَفَّارًا If you leave them, they will lead astray your servants and will not beget except vicious ingrates. Or to put it more simply, he is saying, do not leave on the earth any inhabitant amongst the faithless because if you leave them, they will misguide others amongst your servants and they will not give birth to anyone except uh, those who are um, disbelievers and sinful and, and in this translation this uh, faithless sinful individuals are given as vicious ingrates or fajran kafara. Now uh, this shows us his reasoning for cursing that it wasn't out of ang anger or hatred or being fed up certainly not after having preached for centuries Rather, it was to stop their mischief from spreading because he had now um, secured a handful of followers. Uh, in some reports, we are told perhaps 70 odd uh, uh, believers. And uh, obviously, these uh, elite and other members of the community were now trying to pull these as well who had believed away from Noah, which is why he says they will lead astray your servants. Um, and again, when Nuh says they will not give birth to any except Fajr and Kafara, vicious ingrates, he is not uh, obviously referring to the fact that when they are born, they will be born as vicious uh, ingrates. But he means that they will grow up to become so. Um, we have seen uh, previously an incident where uh, some of the uh, adults in the community of Nuh would uh, actually bring their children to know and warn their children that my father had warned me against this man and I am now warning you against him uh, and you should warn your children not to follow him. So this could be a reason why he believes that they will give birth to or their children will only be raised in that fashion. Um, there is also the fact that uh, um, you know a question that comes to mind is how did Nu know with absolute certainty that they will not give birth to any except uh, Fajr and Kafara. So one could be of course uh, because um, Allah had already told him that no one will now believe except those who have faith in you. Uh, and this is in fact uh, supported from hadith. A man called Salih bin Maytham says, I asked Abu Ja'far, meaning Imam Muhammad al-Baqir salam how did Nuh know the future when he cursed his people and said they will not beget anyone except uh, one who is Fajr and Kafara? And Imam al-Baqir replied giving this verse, chapter 11, verse 36 as proof and said, 
Have you not heard the words of Allah to Nuh saying none of your people will believe except those who have uh, already uh, brought faith? It is also interesting that uh, why Nuh chooses the word Fajran Kafara. Um, kafara we know is um, a superlative or an exaggeration of Kafir, of one who is faithless. And uh, Fajir is one who, here it is translated as vicious, but it is one who is a profligate or one who is immoral. Basically one who sins openly and shamelessly without any fear of God or without seeking to hide his or her immorality is, is, uh, is Fajr. So Kufr or faithlessness relates to one's belief uh, or one's Aqeedah. Whereas Fujur or immorality, that relates to one's actions or one's Amal. And therefore in bringing Kufr and Fujur together and saying وَلَا يَلِدُوا إِلَّا فَاجِرًا kafara." Uh, in a sense what Nuh is saying is they will grow up or they will raise their children to grow up and become both faithless as well as devoid of any good actions. In other words, they will be uh, um, absolutely bereft of any virtue both in, in spirit and in action, in faith and in action. We come now to the final um, verse, which is chapter 28 of this surah, where Nuh um, has a prayer first, and then in the end he again um, curses um, these unjust and wrongdoers. And the verse reads, رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيَّ وَلِمَنْ دَخَلَ بَيْتِيَ مُؤْمِنًا وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ My Lord, forgive me and my parents, and whoever enters my house in faith, and the faithful men and women. And then he says, وَلَا تَزَدِ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا tabara," And do not increase the wrongdoers in anything except ruin. This last part, and do not increase the unjust or the wrongdoers in anything except ruin, it is very, very similar to the ending of verse 24. But in verse 24 he said, do not increase the wrongdoers in anything except error, except dalal. And here he is saying, do not increase them or the wrongdoers in anything except in ruin or tabara. Now, we shall come to that, but uh, let us talk about the first part of the verse first, where he is actually praying for himself and his parents and the faithful. Um, it is interesting as well to note that in all his lamenting and all his prayers and even when he curses, Nuh continuously addresses God as my Lord. If you look at verse 5, verse 21, verse 26 and even now in this verse 28, he's explicitly saying, Rabbi, Rabbi, my Lord, my Lord. Why does he start with forgive me? Some Mufassirun, like there is a Mufassir uh, called Baghdadi, um, he says that because Nuh had forsaken the better option, uh, Tarkul Awla or Tarkul Afdal, and he cursed his people for all the suffering they had uh, caused him, he was now asking God to forgive him uh, for giving up on them and for seeking revenge against them. But this is rather a stretched meaning and really an unnecessary interpretation to the verse. Forgive me is just a general turning to God, which is the practice of all the humble servants of God. And he continues with the prayer. If it was only for a particular reason, he would only ask God to forgive him alone. But the fact that he continues and says, forgive me and my parents and the faithful who enter my home and all the faithful men and women, suggests it's a very general form of repentance in which he is just seeking forgiveness and turning back uh, to God. And therefore, um, it is not attributed to any particular sin. We also know that um, the righteous and the pious, normally when they pray to God, they pray for others first, because that is a sign of being selfless. And then they pray for themselves. But in seeking forgiveness from God, what we are taught in this verse is that when it comes to seeking forgiveness, 
we should seek forgiveness for ourselves first because it is appropriate that one should regard oneself as being sinful before one regards others as being in need of um, forgiveness. It would be presumptuous to assume that others are more sinful and more in need of forgiveness than we are ourselves. And even in the manner in which he prays, he starts with himself and then he moves outwards gradually. He prays for his parents, meaning his family first. And then he prays for the faithful who enters my house, which is his community. And then he prays for the faithful men and women at large. Um, and some have said that here when he prays at large to say the faithful men and women, he is actually praying for all of them, even for those to come later on for other generations. And so there is a great uh, learning in this for us as well, that when we pray to God um, for good or for forgiveness, we start with ourselves, then we don't forget our families, we pray for the faithful in our community, but then we pray for others as well, for posterity as well. Um, the Prophet Abraham as well, Ibrahim alayhi salam, also prays in a similar fashion. In chapter 14, verse 41, um, he, he prays saying, Our Lord, forgive me and my parents and all the faithful on the day when the reckoning is held. Now, there are two interesting points here regarding the word, my house. He says, وَلِمَنْ دَخَلَ بَيْتِيَ مُؤْمِنًا And forgive anyone who enters my house in faith. He doesn't simply say anyone who enters my house. Um, this is significant because by adding this suffix in faith, whoever enters my house and is a mu'min, whoever enters my house in faith, um, he excludes or eliminates members of his family who are faithless. We know, for example, that um, he had one wife who was disobedient and he had a rebellious son, both of whom drowned. So enter my house, whoever, forgive anyone who enters my house in faith excludes them because the word in faith does not refer to them. We know in chapter 66 verse 10, the wife of Nuh is referred to as faithless. So she is excluded. And in chapter 11, verse 46, the son of Nuh uh, who rebelled is referred to as unrighteous conduct. Uh, and therefore he is excluded as well. Um, and again, uh, by saying my house in faith, before saying the faithful men and women, um, this distinction of the faithful who enter my house versus the faithful men and women is our proof that he prayed for his contemporaries, but also prayed for um, all the men and women of faith until the day of um, resurrection. Now, we come to the words, do not increase the wrongdoers in anything except ruin. Um, this means do not, whatever they attempt doing, let them only harm themselves. Um, Previously, we said he had already asked Allah not to increase them in anything except in error. So we could say that previously he was asking Allah to ruin them in their souls and continue uh, uh, them on their misguidance so that they are astray. Whereas now he's actually asking for their physical loss and physical destruction, which was answered with their drowning. We know this because previously when he said, do not increase them in anything but error, the verse had started with, they have led many astray. So because they led many astray, do not increase them in anything except misguidance. Here now, because he has already prayed to Allah, do not leave on the earth any of them. The answer to that will come when they are ruined in the physical sense. There are other explanations for this verse as well. Um, Allama At-Tabatabai believes that they were already ruined with the drowning. So this further prayer to say uh, they were physically ruined in the drowning, he says. So this last prayer to say, do not increase them in anything except ruin, is a reference to the hereafter, meaning um, that they should be punished in the hereafter and on um, the Day of Judgment. 
An interesting uh, point that the Mufassirun have pointed out is, uh, or have mentioned, is that the fact that Nuh combined a prayer and a curse, he prayed for his forgiveness, the forgiveness of the faithful, and he cursed in one prayer. And we know that his curse was accepted, and we know that when God answers a prayer, he does not divide it and answer part of it and doesn't answer the other part. Therefore, we can assume that his prayer for the faithful uh, was also accepted, and therefore they shall be um, forgiven. And this, therefore, brings us to um, the end of our tafsir of this surah. Um, I would like to end um, this tafsir with a verse of Qur'an regarding um, the Prophet Nuh, which I think is a most befitting response and conclusion um, to all the prayers and all the pleas and all the supplications of Nuh in this surah. And this is um, chapter 37, surah to uh, as safat uh, chapter 37, verse um, 75 to 82. Um, Allah praises the Prophet Nuh and shows how he helps those who are patient. He says, وَلَقَدْ نَادَانَا نُوحْ فَلَنِعْمَ الْمُجِيبُونَ Certainly, Noah called out to us, and how well we responded. وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ وَأَهْلَهُ مِنَ الْكَرْبِ الْعَظِيمِ We delivered him and his family from the great agony. وَجَعَلْنَا ذُرِّيَّتَهُ هُمُ الْبَاقِينَ And we made his descendants the survivors. وَتَرَكْنَا عَلَيْهِ فِي الْآخِرِينَ and we left for him a good name among posterity. Salamun ala Nuhin fil alameen. Peace to Noah throughout the nations. Inna kadalika najzil muhsineen. This indeed is how we reward the virtuous. Innahu min ibadin al mu'mineen. He is indeed one of our faithful servants. Thumma agraqna al akhareen. Then we drowned the others. And this brings us to the end of the tafsir of Surah Nuh. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. There are a couple of questions that have come to me from uh, the students who have participated in the, these uh, sessions on the tafsir of Surah Nuh that I wish to answer very quickly. Um, one uh, question is uh, the possible meanings of uh, uh, what Nuh meant when he said, in the last verse of this surah, we saw that uh, Nuh, when praying for forgiveness, said, uh, my Lord, and forgive whoever enters my house in faith. Um, the Mufassirun have explained what my house means and that it could have various meanings. Um, one meaning they say it could mean was my ark because uh, uh, in chapter 10 verse 73 we are clearly told it was those who are with him in the ark that were delivered so when he said my house he meant the ark there is also there are also some reports that say that when he said baiti my house he meant my mosque and the reason for that is because we have some traditions uh, both uh, from the Shia and Sunni uh, that uh, the Prophet Nuh salam, lived in what is present day Masjid Kufa and Masjid Kufa was always a sacred place, it was a mosque and uh, it is believed by some that the flood actually began um, in, in Masjid Kufa um, the Sunni Mufassir Alusi quotes Ibn Abbas to say that my house means my mosque and from a Shia perspective, um, we have a tradition from Imam Ali al-Rida salam, who says that the Prophet Nuh uh, lived in Masjid Kufa, therefore whoever enters my house in faith means whoever enters Masjid Kufa. And there is also a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi in which he says, the mosque is the house of every Prophet. But uh, lastly, um, we should also note that my house does not necessarily have to be a physical structure. It could mean whoever enters what I teach, and it could mean my religion and my teachings. 
Um, in one hadith from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq he says that when Nuh said my house, he meant my guardianship or the wilaya. And uh, this is not too far-fetched because we have, for example, the hadith from um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in which he says the example of my household, my Ahlul Bayt, is like the ark of Nuh. مَثَلُ أَهْلِ بَيْتِكَ مَثَلِ سَفِينَةُ النُّوْ Whoever boards it is saved, and whoever turned away from this ark drowns and perishes. So here the Ahlul Bayt are likened to a physical structure, an ark. Um, similarly, we have a hadith uh, from Rasulullah concerning his companion Salman, uh, who was a Persian. He said, Salman minna Ahlul Bayt. Salman is from us, the Ahlul Bayt. And again, it obviously doesn't mean that he lived in their house, but it means he is part of our household. And therefore, my house could also mean uh, my wilaya. There was also another question um, regarding um, the verse uh, 16, where um, Nuh says to the people, um, have you not seen how your Lord has made the moon a light and the sun a lamp. وَجَعَلَ الْقَمَرَ فِيهِنَّ نُورًا وَجَعَلَ الشَّمْسَ سِرَاجًا And in our lessons, what we said is that some commentators have said the sun has been called a lamp because it is an original source of light. And the moon has been called nur because it reflects light. It is not an original source of light. Now, granted, there are many meanings to nur. And the question was that there are verses where the word nur does not suggest a light that is reflected. Um, for example, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. And so one possible meaning, of course, is that in that verse, Allahu nuru samawat, the verse continues to say, mathalu nurihi, the example of his light. Um, and therefore, Allah himself is not the light, but it is just an example that is given. Uh, but there is possibly another meaning we can take from this verse in Surah Nuh. We might say that uh, Siraj gives light like a lamp, but Nur uh, also gives guidance. We know that since time immemorial, the moon has always served as a source of guidance. People um, in the past would journey, sailors would also in some ways take some guidance, um, astronomers people would look at the moon and uh, celestial bodies for guidance and obviously the light would also, the shining light of the moon when, when it was a full moon, um, that would also serve as uh, a guidance in the absence of the sun. And there are many verses in the Quran where guidance is likened to nur. So that could be another explanation for the verse. A last question that I want to address very quickly is that uh, in one of the earlier sessions, um, we were talking about um, um, guidance and how uh, guidance does not come from the Quran or from the Prophet, but it comes from one's, uh, from within, and that when one has a pure heart and one is sincere and one brings this sincerity and purity before God, then he fills it with guidance. And this was under our discussion of uh, verse 6, where Nuh had complained to God and said, Falam yazidhum du'a'i illa firara, that my Lord, when I summon my people, not only does it not guide them, but it increases them in their evasion. And what we had said was that sometimes guidance can increase evasion. Um, and the Quran as well speaks of how some are guided by it, but some are misguided by it. Now, the question that I got from this um, was, um, that uh, you know, there was there was a participant who felt that uh, it is not just a matter of purity of heart or sincerity, but one needs logical proofs, and uh, one sometimes needs to see a miracle in order to be guided. And I challenged this saying that uh, if you were to preach the same message with the same logical arguments to two people of the same intelligence, one will accept it, one might not accept it is the logical argument the reason why one accepts guidance? And what really is primary? Is it the purity of the heart or is it the mind and the rationalizing of the proofs for the existence of God or witnessing miracles with the eyes? Can miracles really guide a person? There are numerous historic examples of individuals who saw miracles but then pushed it aside as magic or sorcery. 
in this day and age they would push it aside as a scientific phenomenon for example. So to sort of seal that discussion and argument as to whether guidance comes from arguments or miracles or purity of heart, um, I just want to quote some verses here. And this is from chapter 6 of the Quran, Surah Al-An'am, um, verse 109 um, to 111. In verse 109, uh, we are told, They swear by Allah with solemn oaths that if a sign was to come to them, they would surely believe in it. Say, the signs are only with Allah. And what will bring home to you that they will not believe even if they came? In other words, Allah is challenging this, that even if we gave them proofs and all the signs they are asking for, they will not believe. Then verse 110 says, we transform their hearts and their visions as they did not believe in it the first time and we leave them bewildered in their rebellion. Verse 111 of chapter 6, it says, even if we had sent down angels to them and the dead had spoken to them and we gathered before them all things manifestly, they would still not believe unless Allah wished, but most of them are ignorant. And then of course, there is a discussion to this, when does Allah wish someone to be guided? It is really up to the individual. When the individual brings this pure heart and sincerity, then automatically that invokes Allah's wish for them to be guided. It becomes a pure receptacle that can fill itself with the light of God and guidance from Him. So with this brief answers, I hope it clarifies some of the um, questions that have come to me from the tafsir of this surah. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين